Welcome to the Moms I Know with Sheila Walsh Denton and Maria Anderson Farner, two moms on a mission to reclaim childhood and take you from surviving to thriving on your parenting journey. Life is more fun if you play games by Roald Dahl. Hi, this is Maria. And this is Sheila. And we want to welcome you to the Moms I Know. Today, we will be talking about a very fun topic. We're going to talk about games. And Maria and I, in talking this over, you know, there's so many different types of games, genres of games, you know, where games fit in. And we're going to do our best to really break it down into age groups and, you know, and into games that are educational and games that are for fun and games that multiple ages and, you know, kind of go from there. I love this topic because there's this whole reality of that if things are fun, I've always had this philosophy that if things are fun, children remember them. It's more meaningful for them. It's relevant. And there's so many different things that we can approach through games. It's also so important that we're spending time with our children. And this is one of the best ways. Um, I'm here with my grandsons this week, and we're all in the same house together right now. And all he wants to do is play games and, you know, come play with me, come play with me. And they want that attention, but they want it through the games. And so board games or building games or all kinds of different things. And so, yes, it's fun. It's how they learn. And you had an amazing statistic or quote about the importance of play. Yeah. And we mentioned it in an earlier podcast, but here it is specifically. Scientists have recently determined that it takes approximately 400 repetitions to create a new synopsis in the brain unless it is done with play, in which case it takes between 10 and 20 repetitions. So that right there, we should be playing more. And that's the argument that you know where they say in kindergarten, it's becoming less play, right? Less play-based and going to more academic. And it's not really having that big of an impact on learning, the early right. academics. Right. So the, the statistic, I mean, you know, the actual research is not bearing out that this early academics is, is being fruitful. And, and actually, you know, that I can say even down into preschool, I'm seeing more preschools that are going into this more academic realm that we there's this thought that more earlier, better is going to be beneficial. But we really need to look at this whole concept. And we've talked about, you know, the people that were our influencers, you know, Bev Boz with this, you know, play based. We, we've always both been really big on play based learning and that that, you know, play is children's work. That is what they are supposed to be doing. And whether they're playing indoors or outdoors or whether they're playing by themselves or with other playmates or with adults, this is the way they learn. And that statistic is just staggering that, you know, it's such an amazing reduction of repetitions because, you know, they say we do need to learn things over and over and over until it becomes our own core knowledge. But when we do it through play, we learn it so much more deeply and so much more quickly. It's fascinating. You know, and that's why when, you know, when we have babies, we're singing to our babies. We're bouncing with them. We're playing with them because they need us so much. But as they get older, we kind of forget some of those skills. But then yet, we, you know, when we get to the multiplication tables, third, fourth grade, how do the kids really know them? We start singing them. We start, I remember we had the multiplication rap, you know, a <laughs> crazy awesome. CD. Right. Jumping on the trampoline, doing them over and over again, getting them into their bodies. And so, you know, another one, even just learning basic addition with simple card games. I mean, I think really I solidified my facts with, you know, playing 21. You know, those, mm -hmm. those yeah. So um, there's another quote that I, I actually had um, on my Instagram that's from Lawrence J. Cohen. And I really love it. And it's the single most important skill that parents can acquire is playing. And you kind of touched on that already. It's just, it's just, that's what kids want. They want our attention and we can give it to them through play. But oftentimes we are distracted. We're, you know, we're playing with our phone right beside us. We're playing, but we know we have to get dinner on the table. We're playing, you know, so if we, you know, I think the point of this, this podcast is to give a lot of um, jump off points for individual games, games that children can play on their own, but also knowing that, there's plenty of time to do that later and to really to focus on your children, to focus on this time because it's going to have a bigger impact than I think as parents, we really think we really know. Well, and they can tell the difference when we're playing with our 100% focus, they know it. And when, when we're not, they can tell that. And so I've always also felt that, you know, we give children the attention that they're requiring one way or another. And if we can fill them and front load them with that attention, our attention, then they're going to be filled up and they're not going to need to get it in all of those negative ways. 
when they're a that's, little bit older. That's such a good point, Maria. Can you say can you say that again? Because I think that's I think our listeners need to hear that that piece. Can you say that for the first well, part of well, what you that said? idea that if we give our children our undivided attention when they're very small, when we really slow down and really focus on their needs when they're small, then we're filling them up in the way that they need. And then they're not going to need to seek out that attention in negative ways as they get older. Oh, that's huge. <laughs> that's really good. I mean, that's attachment parenting. That's that's what we're, we're doing, what we're doing. So that, that was great. Thank you. Um, so let's go ahead and, and let's talk about toddler games, kind of preschool, those games. What, what do you think? What's what's on your list? Well, for me, I also, you know, I'm coming from the Waldorf background, so simple is better. So for very young children, you know, it's all about they're working with their hands. So nothing takes the place of simple items from nature, but you can also do very simple wooden blocks. Uh, Silk scarves are beautiful. There's a wonderful catalog called Nova Naturals, which has beautiful children's games. And so for me, I feel as if if our children are going to be playing with something, it should be simple. It should, should, should be beautiful. It should also be something that they can use their imagination. They can really embrace their creativity. And so it's not just a single function toy. It's something that they can really use in open-ended ways. And so, again, soft dolls with simple features, um, little wooden animals, just keeping it simple. Yeah, I agree. I definitely had the play silks. I think Sarah's silks, again, from the Waldorf, um, I got mine through Magic Cabin, Hearth Song, two really good um, catalogs for Waldorf-inspired um, toys. And and the play silks are, um, they're just, it opens up for that enchantment, that magic. And, you know, and my children, they use capes and, and forts and um, just all sashes. I mean, all sorts of things that we played those for years and years. We brought them camping with us and we brought, you know, made of flags and banners. I mean, so many things. So I really feel like that is like a definite, everybody should have a, um, the play silks. And like you said, nature, I like the natural fiber, you know, being able to, um, the blocks, wooden blocks. My 10 year old was sick last week and we pulled out the wooden blocks and we left her home for a couple hours as I was you know, doing some work. My husband was at work and, and came home and the whole front room was all blocks, towers and everything. So here she is 10 years old, still using these wooden blocks. So I highly, you know, um, recommend wooden blocks. Another one that's, uh, are the magnetiles. I don't know if your grandchildren have the magnetiles, but that's kind of taking the place of blocks. Uh, I mean, not, I don't want to say taking the place. I, I've seen that question before. So blocks or magnetiles. And really, I think I would definitely invest in blocks, but if you can magnetiles as well, because you can combine the two and they're super fun as well. It's just, they're plastic. And so not as, not as natural, but, but they're a lot of fun. I think um, just you know, the wooden blocks are like the foundation. And then, exactly. you know, like if you could only do one thing, that's just so important. And then the silks, I think those two things alone. And then, of course, you start adding these other things. And, you know, Legos or Duplos, those are something that I know a lot of people really enjoy. Yeah. And you said like the stuffed animals and puppets, you know, the puppet shows and, and the one, you know, puppets are, are, were great. Um, and then, you know, there's like some the activity, some of these activity games that for, for the little ones, like those play silks, th those you can go outside with those and have a great time. Um, th they also have like parachutes, like kind of smaller parachutes that you can have just with a few kids and really have a really good time bouncing a ball on them or getting underneath them and stuff. And the fort building, I think is just, you know, that's what these kids are supposed to do. So give them that space and allow them to, to be creative and, and do their own thing. I actually saw something, I can't remember if it was an article I read, but this woman was talking about the importance of forts, the importance of fort building for children and all the skills that it fosters. And again, that whole cooperative play and even very young children can create together. And so it's really fun to see that. But, you know, really letting them use their imagination. Cardboard boxes. <laughs> right. Yes. <laughs> One of the greatest things. Um, kitchen utensils. Things from the cupboards that you wouldn't think of. Pulling out the pots and the pans. 
you know, I just, the very young children just love to work with the objects that we have in the house. Yeah. I remember going to the store and getting my children, I got them each one and it's like going to be in there when they move out, but a, a hand mixer, you know, a, a, a non-electric ha- hand mixer. And what you do is you put one drop of soap in um, some, some warm water in a big, in a big pot and just give them the hand mixer. And then all of a sudden they're going to have bubbles over overflowing, you know? So that was something that, um, to keep them going as well as like, um, more so like three, four, four, five, but I would, I would make our own ski ball in the front yard, in the front room where we get different sized pots and get bean bags and they'd have to throw them in, in the pots. It's kind of stuff like that. You know, it's like you, you really can look around your house and, and just get creative and, and make games for the, for the littles. I just found our bean bags this morning. That's so funny that you'd say that. And bean bags are wonderful. And you can just make those really simply yeah. with just cloth and rice or, or you know, uh, lentils are a good one to put in. Yeah. Yep. Totally. Um, and so for board games, you know, that age is definitely, we do Candyland, right? Um, one of my kids' favorites was uh, one by Raven, Ravenberger, right? Um, Snail's Pace. Yeah. What's it, Raven? Ravensburger, I think. Yeah. Ravensburger, yeah. Um, snails pa- snail pace race. Snails pace race is a great one. Um, shoots and ladders. These are beginning board games that children can, you know, and probably like four years old, maybe three, three, four. They're, they're starting to um, to learn that. Well, Ravensburger has an amazing array of really beautiful board games and they're I think they're from Europe. And so they're in Germany. They're- My niece was an exchange student. She lived in the town. Oh, and so it's fun. an old like medieval, you know, with a castle and everything. And, and yeah, and they're also well known for their puzzles, really. Yeah, but they're, they're simple games. So there's one up the river. There's the snail's pace run is a great one. There's um, rivers, roads and rails. There's um, labyrinth. Oh, enchanted forest, beginning memory types of things. Even, you know, four and five year old children. Our daughter was always the best at that. It always seemed like the youngest child in the family was the best at the memory games. So it was really fun to see that. So I love the Ravensburger games. Yeah, we the memory games are great like that. And that's and that, you know, can segue us into like some individual games because some of those those memory games are individual, you know, to to um as they get older. I know Solitaire helped my daughter when she was an exchange student. That's what she played religiously. Um but but the other ones, the puzzles are individual, uh, perplexus, which is like a big plastic ball with it in inside of it is a um a maze. And so there's different levels. The kids really like that one. Um, and then there's the one, Maria, that was a hit in your classroom, the labyrinth. Oh, classic. Yeah, the beautiful wooden game where they have the knobs and have to turn them to get the ball. And I think your son is probably the, no, I think it was both Tegan and Lasley ended up mastering that. Yeah, we have our own. So Tegan, yeah, I think he was able to do it forward and backwards and different things. Yeah, so that's, I mean, and I try it and I can only get halfway through. Oh, I can't even get that far. But that's, you know, when we think about these games, so hand-eye coordination, memory skills, you know, the cooperation when they're, you know, a small group of children playing together. So, so many important things that are we're working on, on here. Um, card games. I think that card games, children love card games. When I think back into the classroom, the things that were the, that totally withstood the test of time, kindergarten through sixth grade, the blocks would come out no matter what. The Labyrinth was an all-time classic. The Ravensburger games were always there. And then dominoes, whether they used them to make that, you know, like they'd set it up as the run and knock that one down and it would, you know, knock down the whole run of them. But then also learning to play dominoes. And then also the card games. I think the children, you know, they'd come up with their own, then we'd teach them some. And so wonderful, wonderful memory, math skills, all kinds of things. Yes. Uh, Egyptian War was the most popular one in your classroom that my children still play. To this, yes, to this day, um, they still play Egyptian War and uh, BS, but there was a different name in your classroom, right? Because they couldn't play. I doubt it. <laughs> they called it I Doubt It. I doubt it. <laughs> I love it. Um, yeah. And so the card games, you know, one of our favorite card games, and I believe the youngest could maybe be six, seven years old is Five Crowns. I mean, do you ever, have you ever played a five crowns? Oh, it's a great family game that you, you know, Rebecca and her kids, as they get a little bit older, um, would, would just love. And it's kind of like based on hearts a little bit, but there's actual character cards. And so, um, hearts, gin type, type game. 
Um, we had crazy eights and spoons and um, Uno. That was one that right. you know, kids have always loved Uno. Yeah, Uno. Um, and, you know, you said the dominoes in the classroom. But the other thing that was always going on in your classroom, and I was so happy that all three of my children know, is play chess, chess and checkers. But chess is such a strategy game and it's timeless. And it's really, you know, my um, he was then like five years old. My son was playing with his grandfather. And, and so it's just like the, that's the game that crosses the generations. And I believe it's like a good life skill. <laughs> yeah. And and the age ranges. So, you know, we're looking at strategy there. And so they're learning the different moves. They're thinking about strategy. So, you know, all of these are such important skills. I was just playing some games with my six year old grandson the other day, just little like pre reading, pre writing skills where we were making little mazes and we were both following along with pencils. We were just creating things. And, you know, so there's so much that we can do through play. And mm -hmm. uh, there was a wonderful article years ago in one of the, I think it was Hearthfires magazine. It was a family that kind of did the entire curriculum K through eighth grade through games. And so, you know, there's those games that are more thematic. So all kinds of games for mathematics. So, you know, we've already mentioned some of those like, you know, checkers, chess, Chinese checkers, the card games. Um, Go was another strategy one that's amazing. Battleship for coordinates, learning the graphing skills, the, lots of different multiplication types of games. Moncala, it's a beautiful game. Moncala is mm -hmm. one that the children always love. There's Sequence and Mastermind, again, to kind of strategy and probability, right? Mm -hmm. Um Rumi, I always say this wrong. It's kind of an inside joke. Now I don't know which way you say it, but I can't say uh, Rumi cube, Rumi cube, Rumi, Rumi cube. Yeah, do you know that one? Yeah, we're thinking of the philosopher, right? Yeah, yeah. right, right, right. <laughs> yeah, Rumi cube. Um, see, I'm like, is that right? I don't know, but that's that's a great game. And we actually just got it um, recently, and uh, we we love it. Well, I think of even like the, the, the Rubik's Cube, how many children get fascinated with the Rubik's Cube and trying to problem solve these things. Um, also, as they get older, there's wonderful games out there that are more um, his, history based. And so there's, you know, like the Settlers of Catan and Carcassonne. And you know, so just there's all kinds of ways that we can bring those things in. Backgammon's another strategy oh, one. That's, that's that's my favorite. Yeah. Backgammon is a game. My husband and I still play backgammon. That's great. That's a friend of mine's game, too. Like December, January on those winter nights, you know, we'd always each evening we'd play backgammon. He's just so good at it. I just yeah. Same with Brent. I know I beat I beat him like once every 10, 15 times, you know, and I'm like, yes. Um, the other games, you know, uh, for my family, like my mom, my what my mom plays with her grandchildren, Scrabble. You know, mm. whenever we get to family together, we do, we always have a game of Scrabble. But one thing that I, I game that I liked as a child and uh, I went on eBay to see if I could find it. A vintage one was Boggle and they're now reselling it again. But Boggle is such a fun game for that the emerging, I mean, all age, but the emerging reader, you know, looking at um, different ways to find, to find the words. Um, another really good one, Apples to Apples. And it, oh, so they fun. have a, they have a junior edition, which is, which is a great, um, a great one to play as well. And apples to apples is another one that, you know, really spans the ages. And so, you know, we're looking at this whole concept of uh, intergenerational living now. And, you know, that's certainly something that's big on my mind, the games that can engage from, you know, four or five years old all the way up through the adults. And apples to apples is one of those that really does, does that. Yeah. And, and you know, all of the games also that we're talking about today, you know, they're, they're not really competitive. They're, they're fostering this lovely interplay and they're fun and they're educational and they're inspiring. And they're not, I, I just, I find them to be very uplifting. And, and unfortunately there's a lot of games out there that might not quite fit that. So when you're, when you're looking at games, you know, obviously we're sharing a lot of them today, but also when, you know, when our listeners are thinking of their own, is it open-ended? Can it span the ages? Does it, is, has it withstood the test of time? Is it something that is beautiful? Is it inspiring to play? I love to think about all of those things. Do the children ask for it? You know, that, that, mm -hmm. that's it. Yeah. And so I think about the, the games that my 10 year old always wants to play is Clue. You know, she likes the, the Clue and earlier it was, uh, life, you know, she liked those games. Um, I mean, a game that we didn't bring up as I'm looking at is the, to as the toddler is connect four that can also play at any ages, but you know, th but at, starting younger, four years old, they can play connect four, mm -hmm. you know, that, that, that's really good one. Um, and then there's, um, have you heard of the game goblet? 
Um, I've seen it. I haven't played it before. It is a fabulous game. It is a fabulous game that is strategy, you know, and it's one again that can uh, span the ages. And so we really like go Goblet. And another one, um, a wooden game, which I, I really kind of like the wooden games. Goblet's a wooden game, but have you Cathedral? Yes. You know, that's another one that is fun to play on its own as blocks, but it also it's another type of strategy game where you try to put as many blocks as you can um, around the, the, you know, the, the, the cathedral. So um, you had also, we were talking earlier, Yahtzee, another one oh. for, for mathematical skills. You know, that's we did a that a lot days of Yahtzee for math through for homeschooling, for sure. You know, just multiples and, and different things and adding and, you know, same with like what you already mentioned, the dominoes, but that's the multiples, you know, and that's what we're constantly working on the fact families and stuff like that. And I find that children that play games like this, you know, I, I've worked with so many children over so many decades now. And when they're learning math skills out of context, you know, say, for example, just in a workbook or abstractly, they're not understanding the concepts behind them. They're, when, they're, when they're actually working with physical objects, they're actually working with these different um, games, they're learning it in ways that are much more meaningful for them. And it becomes part of not only their own core knowledge, but their understanding of the principles behind these things. And so I just find that children that have played lots of games with their families really have a greater depth of understanding of these concepts. So it's always fun to see that. We're also talking about the fact that, you know, we want to spend as much quality time with our children as possible. They love playing games with us. We're turning off the screens. We're not, you know, we're not having that screen time because that's taking away from that family time. It's taking away from that creative time. It's also, you know, there's a lot of studies out there. I know we've done podcasts on the the, the screen time, but I really look at that takes away from all of the cognitive skills that are that we want to be building in our children. And so really, you know, why do we play games? Because they're fun, because they encourage all kinds of um, social interaction and cognitive skills and really helps with this whole idea of social living and really deepening their understanding of concepts. Yeah. And I think, you know, especially with math, it's like when you're playing Yahtzee, when you're, um, when you're doing dominoes, you don't have the anxiety, you know, you don't, you like that the worksheets, you know, create and everything. And, and same with Boggle and Scrabble. It's like, there's less anxiety to experiment with words and to, to throw your tiles out there and to see what comes up. I mean, how many times I should remember when my youngers were playing Boggle over two thirds were not non-words. Right, right. But they were just playing with them and, and do we were doing it in a fun way. And so it allowed that space to be to have fun, to laugh, to to be creative. Yeah, I was going to say we're laughing together. We're ha we're just making, you know, it's silly. And so we're just enjoying ourselves. There's actually a scientific term for this, the affective filter, which, you know, I learned in my education realm, is that when when we get anxious, when we start to feel overwhelmed, that affective filter goes up. And no further learning can actually happen at that point. So when we get overwhelmed with something, the, the, the actual progress of learning stops. And so when we can do these things in these playful ways, and I think, you know, good, you know, teachers in the classroom know this. And so they try to make things as fun as possible. And there's so much more hands-on games type of, of learning going on in so many classrooms now. But, you know, when we can do this as a family, why not? Right. I remember when I was a high school teacher, I'd always at the end of the unit have a Jeopardy. You, you know, we do, we do a Jeopardy game and, and, and so that they would um, help them study. And they always loved it, of course. You know, and so we even did a baseball math game on the board, you know, where, you know, they had to play different little math skills and then we would advance on the baseball field. And Yeah, it's, very, it's funny. It made me think of bingo. There's math bingo and sight word bingo and just bingo bingo. You know, it's, it's such such a great game as well. We actually had this big setup that I, I had to buy for the family, you know, we were right camping with us and stuff. Which reminds me of also the matching games. The mem I mean, we talked about memory games, but like the matching, like they're just different picture cards for very young children with no words and they can match them and find them and create sets creating sets. So all of these are different skills that we're learning. So we're just having a good time with it. Yeah, I'm just trying to think back to just over all of the years. I'm sure there's all kinds of games that we're forgetting as we're talking about this today. But again, just going back to that, really thinking about what is what is the objective here with these games. And I'm finding that, you know, we're really focusing today on these indoor games, on the kind of board games or individual games. 
And so I'm thinking that we'll do a follow-up podcast, more thinking about more outside games, movement, sports. We'll be talking about that a little bit more in the future. Um, you mentioned puzzles, and I wanted to go back to puzzles a little bit because when I was younger, my grandmother always had a huge jigsaw puzzle going. She had a separate table, and it was the you know the thousand piece puzzle. And there were ones that were beautiful scenes of things, and then there were the ones that were just totally abstract. And she was amazing at them. And so as young children, we would kind of creep up and be watching. So, you know, that was always fun to do as a whole family. But then there were also the younger version, you know, the, the, just a few pieces. And so with very young children, you can start with those ones where they have to put a piece into a matching shape. And then you can go to just a few pieces and move up. But I think the puzzles are really wonderful. And then, of course, you know, the car games, the family games. There was something we used to play called Botticelli, which was a very advanced version of 20 questions. But just, you know, having fun with it as a family and the whole age range. And I always loved watching parents and my grandparents playing games together because it just felt like. Mm -hmm. you know, well, no, like it's like my mom, you know, she's 77, going to be 78. And she still plays cards every week. You know, I mean, that, that that's her social thing. And I remember as a kid growing up that she they'd have card parties and all the time. And, you know, as a little kid, we'd I'd hang out with the, the, the children. And my parents would play cards and, and she's also the grandma. She has the, uh, the table with the puzzle on it, you know? And so when you grow up like that, I think it's part of you, like we've talked about our family culture, you know, and it's just like you, it's things to do inside with, with each other. It's like, we, yeah, you can read, yeah, you can watch TV, but Hey, let's all play a game. I, I know families that do family game night and everything. And I think that's such a great idea, um, to, spend intentional time. We actually have kind of a um a family game night but we do it with my brother-in-law and his children and so it becomes kind of a bigger thing and and we play we actually play five crowns with two decks or we play different games such as um so similar to apples to apples and stuff like that and it's just you know with the cousins and it's just so it's just so much fun and I think you know what, why we're why we're doing this podcast is just to inspire you to to pick up some games to um, find some new some new inspiration. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. That reminds me. A couple of years ago, I was at a thrift store and I found an old set of mahjong, and mm -hmm. it's just so beautiful. It's they're made with like bamboo, and then I it's probably not ivory, but it's probably like a synthetic. But it's just beautiful, beautiful things. Uh, objects and I don't know how to play it yet but you know it's something that I've always thought oh down the line I'll learn that and I actually met somebody the other day and there's a group of women that are getting together weekly and playing mahjong you know so it's just you never know so you can revive some of these you know the games that have been around for for generations right right yeah but it gets people together it gets it's a reason to be social and it's a reason to have fun you know and that's what we need more of that in our in our oh, in our life so much so much more of that so well, I'm excited. I'm thinking of, you know, pulling out, all, well, my grandsons have been pulling out the game. So <laughs> you said Clue was one that was out there. So another strategy thing, yeah. but lots of possibilities ahead. So um, I'll look forward to really talking with you more about the, the outside games as well. I've got a lot of thoughts on that and I know you do as well. But for today, this whole idea of just get, get you know, get in there with your families. I love the idea of bringing families together and just have that games time. Yep. It sounds good. All right. We'll talk to you next time on The Moms I Know. Take All care. Bye-bye. Right. Thanks for joining us today for The Moms I Know. To learn more about Sheila and her online program, The Mom Map, visit purplebeatnutrition.com. For Maria's monthly blog and to learn more about her group program and retreat, visit socalessentials.com. That's S-O-Q-U-E-L essentials.com. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of The Moms I Know. Until next week, have a joyful family journey.